Hey, what's up? Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Simply Pod Logical, a Simply Now Logical podcast. Hello there. <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by Oats Overnight. Oats. Making DIY overnight oats can be tedious, difficult, and time consuming. Mm. Oats Overnights gives you the option to have different flavors each morning without having to source, measure, and prepare dozens of ingredients. It's like a delicious overnight oats shake that's high in protein, low in sugar, and gluten-free. Just check out oats.com slash simply and receive 10% off your order. With my code, simply. Your code, simply. What what oat flavor are you trying this week, uh, simply? All the oats. I mix <laughs> all them all the... together. No, I'm just kidding. But that could totally be a video idea. Uh, uh, this sure. morning, I had peanut butter cookie dough cocoa crunch it's like the long word one sure. <laughs> it's so it's in an orange package it's so good oh my god mm. i love it it's like peanut butter but like also cookie dough which personally i love something that tastes like dessert in the morning so that's my breakfast and also recently i've just been sipping on it throughout the day like two hours later i'll be like i want a little bit of oats <laughs> and then i'll just sip on it and then i'll make another one for like later in the day yeah, you're not yeah. supposed to do that. You're supposed to have them the next morning, but I've been I cheating. I think you can have them whenever you want, you know. I guess you can. I can do whatever I like with we, my oats. We all need some emergency oats in the fridge sometimes. Yeah, you just you never know. know when you feel like oats. So that's why you can go to oats.com slash simply because I have my own little URL now and you can use my code simply for 10% off oats overnight. Cool. Thank you, sponsors. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, oats. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to talk about the fact that Christine walked in on me crying while playing video games. Mm, yeah, sad <laughs> times. So not really. Well, kind of. We're, we're going to talk about just sort of what's going on in our lives, what, we're, what we've been up to, how we're passing the time. Life update. Life update, but story time video. <laughs> but yeah, one thing that's been going on is I've been playing a lot of video games. Mm. And Christine happened to walk into the room as I was finishing The Last of Us Part 2. And I was a little emotional. I wasn't. Yeah. I wasn't crying, but I was. Uh... And I was a little concerned. So I think we should talk about it. I think you were mostly <laughs> surprised that a video game would elicit any sort of emotional reaction. Yeah. And I think it's an interesting distinction that maybe we could give people some context. Like, when we were growing up, uh, video games. The storyline in video games was really incidental to the gameplay. I would say, you know, if I'm playing a Mario game, I'm a plumber saving a princess from like a dragon thing. It doesn't matter. I'm just enjoying playing the game. And like in high school, if you're playing like Mario Kart or, you know, Guitar Hero was just an excuse to drink with your friends and have some yeah. fun. There was nothing about like the narrative experience of the game that mattered, right? Right. And you kind of forgot about it once you were finished the game. Like you didn't think about it later at night. I'm not usually. like thinking about Guitar yeah. Hero in my dreams, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think something really changed in video games around the time when we were like at the end of high school, maybe. Hmm. Where a lot of these like big budget video games became these really big cinematic narrative experiences And I really just missed out on all of that because I stopped really playing games other than retro games around that time So all of a sudden in quarantine now I like I'm just gonna buy a ps4 This was a while back and I've kind of been taking the last few weeks to buy some of like the big triple-a big budget games I missed out of and I'm just experiencing them for the first time. So I played the first last of us game uh, recently, even though that game came out like seven years ago, and I really enjoyed it. And the sequel just came out. So I just beat The Last of Us Part Two. So this is a very popular game right now. Like anyone who knows video games has either heard of this or is playing it. Sure, yeah. It's one of the best-selling PS4 games. I think it's maybe like the last big one that will come out before they come out with new consoles for this holiday season. But uh, it was also a really controversial game, and we spoke about it a little bit off camera. And I think you seemed pretty interested in, yeah, you seemed pretty interested in the sort of reception and reaction to the game, mm -hmm. maybe more so than a video game in and of itself. Well, as someone who doesn't really mm -hmm. play video games that much, I just found it interesting what some of the discourse around this whole storyline was as an outsider, I guess, because like I'm not engaged with this game or haven't developed a relationship with the characters or sure. have certain like viewpoints of how get video games should be and who the main characters should be so <laughs> yeah. i just found it interesting so uh, i'm gonna try to talk about it without like revealing the major most significant spoilers but if you really care about the game and are still going to right. play it and you don't know about it maybe tune out for a minute and just jump to this 
timestamp or something when we're talking about something else. So you're but, talking about the first and the second, The Last of Us? Yeah, but I mean, the first one came out seven years ago. Oh, it's oh, kind of it too bad. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. That. Even though I just <laughs> I played it. Was it. I somehow didn't have it spoiled for me at all wow. in the last seven years, which okay. is kind of so crazy. So maybe don't listen to our next reactions <laughs> if... Uh, yeah, you yeah. want to play that game. Actually, I think a funny way of talking about this too is Christine just happened to walk in on me playing it a few times. <laughs> yeah. So the first time she walked in and I'm playing as uh, the second female protagonist you play as in the game, Abby, who is this girl with who looks very strong. And I think Christine was like, wow, that girl looks really strong. And we all know Christine's like really into weightlifting and stuff. So I think you liked seeing well, a strong looking I woman think, in a video game. I think I'd seen you play it before, but I didn't really look at it other than notice that you were playing a male character from the first mm -hmm. series or season. Whatever you the whatever first game, yeah. And then later, I guess it was the second iteration and you were playing as a female character. I didn't know if this was your choice or how it worked. And then Ben explained it to me like you don't really have these choices. They no. kind of decide who the, mm -hmm. the narrator or the main character is for you. And that's part of the storyline. And this is going to sound kind of silly, but like one of the controversial things about the game or one thing some people have had an issue with is just the fact that you're, there is that female character and that you who have looks to that play strong. Her? Yeah, the like fact people... you play her because she does something that uh, people who liked the first game a lot don't like. But I think it's just the fact that some people just took issue with the fact that there was a female character who looks unrealistically buff. And maybe so it's not even fair to put it that there? way. Because this is what I wanted to challenge. I don't <laughs> think you should take this criticism that seriously. Because I think for the last, you know, 20 years, people mostly men have been playing video games with completely unrealistic depictions of women mm -hmm. with like no waists and enormous Lara breasts. Croft, Tomb Raider. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Although to be fair to her, like as those games have progressed over the years, they've gotten, they've made her more of a real character and not just like a sex object for men. Mm -hmm. And I think we should be kind of careful in this conversation just in the sense that I know people who are really invested in video games are kind of hypersensitive to the criticism of video games being sexist. But I think it's very fair to say it's kind of undeniable that the portrayals of in of women in a lot of video games have portrayed like hyper unrealistic female bodies. At least historically. Yeah. Like that's what we're saying that historically decades ago. I mean, maybe the landscape is totally different right now. Mm -hmm. And on average, it isn't as bad as it used to be. But that's kind of the history of it. Yeah. Right. But I, I just think like if you really take issue with the fact that there's a female character in the game with giant biceps. If you weren't also complaining about the like then you hyper <laughs> unrealistic women with like enormous breasts and no no waist and just like those unrealistic bodies, yeah. why would you have an issue with this unrealistic body? But is it an, an unrealistic body that a woman just looks strong? I think a woman could look strong, but like she looks more jacked than most of the guys in the game, <laughs> which is interesting. Maybe I she mean, just works out more. Maybe, yeah. Like, I don't think that... Maybe that they have should... steroids in the... Uh... No. I should probably explain just briefly. Like, like the premise of the game is there's a infection that hits Earth, and it's essentially like a zombie game. The infection turns people into basically mm -hmm. zombies. So you're kind of like 20, 30 years in the future of that outbreak, uh, and society's trying to rebuild itself in factions, essentially. So in the first game, you're... A guy who uh, has a job to take a girl across America because she's immune to the infection and they think maybe they can develop a cure from her. Hmm. And the second game uh, continues that story and it really deals with the aftermath of the first game. And yeah, I think the storyline is, I don't want to ruin the story for anyone who hasn't played it, but I think... Uh, the story is the primary, like the gameplay is whatever. If you like it, you like it. It's it's enjoyable, I think. It's not that different than the first game. But it you're really playing for the story so much so that there were points in the game which I like really didn't care about playing the video game. I really just wanted to see what happened story. next in yeah. the story. And I'm not going to say people who don't like the story are wrong. I I think there are issues with it. But I really respect the fact that they went with a very... They were very ambitious and bold in some of the decisions they made. Like this game is the opposite of fan service. Hmm. They could have made a second game that just made people happy in the same way the first one did with the same characters and just playing off the same sort of emotional tone. But they really went for a more ambitious and emotional story. And it's like super depressing and hard to get through which is kind of an interesting thing. Like, why do we watch movies and TV shows that are 
that make us sad and are so dark and things. To feel something. Yeah, just to feel some <laughs> sort of human emotion. Anyway, I, I'll tell you, I, I liked the story. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason I liked it is that it wasn't just... Again, what I was saying, like, there is a way of telling a story that just would have made everyone sort of happy, but it would have been very safe. And I really respect when there's a sort of artistic vision for telling uh, a story of character growth and development that is sort of challenging for the audience. And I think just a lot of people didn't want that. Mm -hmm. And there's a point at the close to the end of the game, spoiler alert, where you see Ellie, the, who's the character you have like the most emotional attachment to. She has a chance to sort of let go of her need for revenge or let go of the past and just sort of accept a chance at a really happy future that she has. And you think the game might be over and then you keep playing because she hasn't let go of the fact that she needs to get revenge for something. Mm -hmm. And that was why when you walked in on me at the end of the game and I was sad, I was thinking about that and thinking about how real, how real a depiction of uh, human fallibility that is like you know what I mean like there are plenty of people who have a chance to make their lives better but can't let go of something or make they an obviously bad something. decision yeah. or hold on to things hmm. so it's like teaching you deeper lessons than you anticipated upon entering this world I think it's a really mature and realistic depiction of of a revenge story and it that also... isn't just satisfaction about killing people Good. Yeah, I like that. I can yeah. appreciate that as someone who's not really interested in playing games surrounding violence. So I, I like that there's sure. a bit more to this. And correct me if I'm wrong, because I did not follow the storyline. <laughs> you know, quite. I just kind of yeah. asked Ben about it, mostly because I don't want to witness the violence. Yeah. Uh, but didn't they challenge a lot of norms like in the storyline in terms of their characters? And didn't she have like a female partner at the end? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So they're like the main protagonist is a lesbian and mm -hmm. has a female partner in the game and they <laughs> and the other female character you play as is that absurd very strong one yeah. so i think both the main female characters are sort of defying right certain gender stereotypes i think a lot of so there was some controversy around this game partly because the plot of the game leaked actually months before it came out mm. and a lot of people reading that plot assumed that it was trying to project a very progressive kind of social justice message on people. I really don't think anyone who played the game from start to finish would actually reach that conclusion because yeah, the two main characters are women and one of them is a lesbian and the other is uh, strong. They're not like throwing, putting, pushing that down your throat as if you have mm -hmm. to like take some deeper political meaning from that. And anyone who feels that way, that's that says more about your baggage than the game, I think. Right. Well, isn't that kind of what happened in some of the chatter rooms? Maybe it's men who... The chatter rooms? I don't know. I don't know. These, there must be forums. <laughs> Wherever of like, people yeah. talk about video so games. So like maybe yeah. men who were upset apparently with the second uh, season of this because of <laughs> yeah, the choice of game, characters yeah. and and who they are and you can't really change that. You're no longer playing the, the, ma the main male protagonist, right? right? So the fact that like they now have to play these women you know, may have challenged their beliefs and upset them in a way. I think... Which I like. <laughs> Well, I think the creators of the game deserve some kudos in the sense mm -hmm. that I don't think they did it just to prove a point, but they knew they were going to get backlash just for yeah. the fact that, you know, it's a video game where you're playing as a lesbian and a strong woman. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, and it's one of the best selling games of all time and it's a high, super high profile game. They knew they were going to get backlash just for that fact alone. There is uh, another spoiler. There is a transgender character also in the second half of the game. And I thought that was done like really tastefully and certainly not in a way that's trying to promote any sort of political agenda. Like I really don't see how you could play the game in good faith and come to the conclusion it's trying to make you think certain w way about things politically or be like a social justice warrior or agenda game. Like people who talk like that are just yeah. out, out to lunch, I think. It's kind of mm -hmm. nuts. And yeah, I think we have to acknowledge that... Uh, there is some toxicity in the video game community. I want to be careful how I say this too, because, you know, we, we talked about the beauty, the beauty community, community a few weeks ago. <laughs> is and... the video game community toxic, Ben? <laughs> careful. So in the same way the beauty community is, I think the gaming community has to acknowledge the toxicity within it. 
So just to recap, we, we did an Ask Us Anything episode a few weeks back, and one of the questions was, is the beauty community online toxic? And my position is that it is uniquely toxic in some ways. I think that's pretty obvious from... But not every single person in the community is toxic, but sure. and in I, summary. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah and, but I think it's pretty clear that there is toxicity within it, systematically, I, even you could say. And I think you can say that based off the sort of discourse around beauty content and in terms of who some of the most popular beauty creators are on the platform and the fact that chat rooms that like to talk about beauty content enjoy way more talking about negativity than just people doing makeup looks. I think it's kind of ironic that, hmm. you know, like subreddits that were super mad at me calling makeup superficial are kind of the best evidence of the fact of how negative the beauty online beauty community is because those are the people who have 24 pages of threads on drama get and you know but i think the mistake i made in that conversation is one i didn't really acknowledge that a guy just labeling makeup in general superficial is going to upset a lot of women women yeah. because more women use makeup than men so i wasn't really sensitive to that fact and i really didn't mean to imply that anyone who uses makeup is superficial or dumb and i also don't know why calling something superficial is like some huge insult. like i enjoy some goofy frivolous superficial things like calling a topic superficial isn't like the worst thing you can say about something but you you very eloquently pushed back on my characterization and explained how a lot of people use makeup for artistic reasons i think the point still holds that there is toxicity in the beauty community, and it is not just a function of the size of the beauty community. Because I saw some people saying that. It's just that the fact that there's millions of people who watch beauty content, so of course there's going to be some negativity within it. I don't think that explains the uniquely negative aspects of the beauty community. The same way I don't think it uniquely explains the negativity within the gaming community. And I think it's reasonable to ask if the substance or the subject matter of a community mm -hmm partly contributes or explains as to why there is negativity within it. Interesting. You hear what I'm so saying? So with video games, what's the connection there? So I think with there, it's maybe a little bit simpler in the fact that just a lot of young men play video games. Mm -hmm. And I think any hobby or interest that is dominated by young men is going to have a certain element yeah. of misog misogyny and homophobia within it. Almost like frat boy culture. But now we're talking about like video game culture where like a bunch of boys get together. Sure. And, yeah. And the same way I wanted to be, I clarified how I wanted to be careful with the beauty stuff. I want to be careful here because video games are a billion dollar industry now. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of people who play games aren't guys hanging out on, you know, 4chan complaining about transgender people appearing at video games or getting mad at video game journalists who are women. You know what I mean? Like, right vast majority of people who play video far, games are, yeah. are probably perfectly decent people yes you know so but i think anyone who is invested in the gaming community they probably know better than us as outsiders about how much negativity does exist within it and what mm -hmm. the reasons for that might be and i bet you there's a lot of bias or discrimination against women who game right i i think we would be shot i would love to get uh a woman who streams video games mm -hmm. for a living to get her on the podcast and i bet they would invariably have like crazy stories about the sort of harassment and toxicity yeah. they face right and totally. i won't say who but even at a youtube event i remember we just happened to get into an elevator with another female creator who makes not only but does some gaming content and just in like that 30 second elevator meeting uh, interaction, the the idea of how much harassment she gets for being a female gamer came up like very quickly. Yeah. So yeah, I think, yeah, you can't have a conversation about the online gaming community without acknowledging the sort of baggage and the negativity that does exist within that space too. And that's something I've never had to face because always my audience has been 90% female just because of the nature of my content i guess so not that like a female audience isn't capable of being no no, no. i mean sorry i meant negativity from like a sexist perspective oh, gotcha. is something that i don't face often because my audience is 90 percent female i guess so you're you're not you know interacting in a space where you're not expected to be a certain gender or not yeah do you think if a man man came along doing like nail art looks though they'd face any sort of 
backlash? I don't think so. I think they would. Yeah, for sure. In the same way that when I painted your nails, you know, there was a few comments, sh- sh- like, especially sorry. when okay, the video yeah. got on trending that like, oh, you let your girlfriend paint your nails. Like basically you're a simp, but that was before the term simp existed, but had it existed. <laughs> so that reaction would come from like people outside of that community though, I think. Yeah. I feel like audiences of beauty content, maybe more than anything, are very accepting of men or women being... Good point. So the 10% who are men, who this is just according to YouTube analytics, like that's just... Like 10% the, that's of why your I'm audience that, are yeah, men? Yeah. Are extremely supportive. Yeah. And totally. I love their comments. <laughs> and, and they love you and they just love, you know, just the acceptance of nail polish on anyone. So yeah. I love the guys who watch my content. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who watch gaming content too that are perfectly don't see it as an issue at all that they're watching a woman play video games right yeah one of my favorite uh gaming channels by the way is uh girlfriend reviews have you i think i've i think, I think we watched a couple I of videos it was funny, right? so a very unique take it's basically uh it's a review of a video game from the perspective of your partner watching their partner play the video game. But the girlfriend, correct me if I'm wrong, because it's been a while, she doesn't really like know much about the game and that's why it's funny? Or does she really know everything? I think, you know, it may have started that way, but clearly they both participate in the gameplay. But I think they they grabbed onto a very unique perspective on video game reviews that really resonated with people. Because I think we underestimate how many people just enjoy being a passenger to watching people play video games. I guess mm-hmm. you can't really relate to this, but like a lot of us growing up, if you had a sibling, probably can really are almost nostalgic about that feeling of watching someone else play I video games. I used to watch my dad play a bunch of video games, yeah. including Tomb Raider. Oh yeah, Lara Croft <laughs> with the pointy boobs back yeah. in 1998. Tomb Raider, <laughs> Doom, Duke Nukem. Oh, he really went for those yeah, macho every, games. He'd get home from work, and I'd be like, "Dad, let's go play," but I'd yeah, make yeah. him play because I was too scared but I wanted to actually watch it, but I just never felt good enough. And I thought I would be killed. Mm-hmm. Weird. I'm just so weird. <laughs> Anyways. That's funny. Anyway, I, so I, I've been enjoying some time in quarantine, catching up on all these big video games that have come out in the last five to 10 years that I just never got to experience. And it's just the main takeaway for me is just how much of a cinematic narrative Mm -hmm. and like sort of rich story they are so like i'm not embarrassed to say like the end of that game made me emotional i know we sort of joked you cried a little i wasn't you were you were tearing your eyes were watering and i was like man i was a little i was a little choked up here's the thing i don't get me wrong i'm not i would admit if i was just like bawling my eyes out because i think that's totally fine i was Mm -hmm. you play a game for 20 to 30 hours and then it's over you grow an emotional attachment to these characters maybe the story is hopefully good. Like, like there's a way for video games to make you feel something emotionally. And that's fine. Like if you're just emotional, like there's a way of detaching yourself from something so you don't feel that emotion. And I just think that's kind of weak, you know, like let yourself feel it. Give yourself over to the art in a way and let yourself feel something for the story. And maybe you didn't like the story and that's fine. But for anyone who did resonate with it somewhat and sort of Ellie's trajectory more than anything, I think if you got to that game without feeling some emotion, <laughs> there's something wrong with You're you. You're a robot. Because <laughs> yeah. we feel like uh, I'll, I'll, I've cried at uh, like movies before. And this is basically just a movie that was 30 hours long, you know? Yeah. What's the what's the goofiest movie or TV show or something you've cried at? I cried at the finale of Dexter because it was just so bad. <laughs> like, I was I, like, I, this show is ending like this. Are you kidding? <laughs> Dexter was one of my favorite shows. So that's a very different reason, but I remember this because we we watched it together, right? I wasn't invested in the show like you were, but we watched the last season together and I could tell how much you cared about it. And that last episode was just so bad. Yeah, That might be like the worst end of a TV show ever. Yeah. I also (laughs) cried when, and I'm sure everyone did, when Derek Shepard died in Grey's Anatomy. Spoiler alert. It's not a spoiler. This is like eight years ago now. (laughs) Like if you don't know that now, whatever. Yeah, that was devastating, like truly (laughs) devastating. That's a pretty good goofy example. It's not goofy. It was devastating. That show is like trying to make you. It's basically I, a soap opera. I know. Right? That show has just killed so many people. It's just unfair. <laughs> and you know what? It's kind of annoying when a show kills off someone when it's clear they just wanted off the show well, and it Patrick didn't really Dempsey serve the narrative. went on to become a race car driver. And I'm so mad at him because had he not wanted to race cars around the track, he would have been Derek Shepard for longer and been around for Meredith. So. That guy's a race car driver now? Yeah. Is he any good? 
I don't know. Or did he just get a bunch of money and like, I want to drive cars fast? I, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> oh, you haven't I didn't, followed I didn't follow his, his racing career? career? <laughs> no, but I'm sure he's forever known as Dr. Dreamy. I'm sure people on the track will be like, hey, Dr. D- Dr. Dreamy. Is it Mick Dreamy? <laughs> Mick Dreamy, sure, whatever. How do you not? Come on. Dr. Derek Shepard. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with crying at video games. Yeah. <laughs> One other thing I will mention. So, because you said earlier that I noticed two things. Mm-hmm. So the first was I noticed that the, the female character you were playing was really strong, which mm-hmm. I loved. And I was like, yeah, You're okay get it, it, girl. And then um, <laughs> okay. the second thing was I accidentally walked in when there was like a really violent scene going yeah. on. And it was, I won't spoil it, but so awful <laughs> just for me to I like. I think we could say. I was like listening to some fun music. Maybe I painted my nails. I can't remember. And then I just walked in and witnessed this. And I was like, Ben, what the fuck? Ben, what the fuck? <laughs> And I like ran away. I don't think it's a spoiler. Christine walked in during a, a, a cutscene where you see a woman getting her arm broken brutally with like a hammer. I, I just think remember them saying, I'm going to clip your wings. Yeah. So actually, that's funny. That's the moment you walked it's in. It's not funny. Well, <laughs> okay. It's a bit of a coincidence, but that is the first clip of the game they showed, I think, before it came out. Like that was their oh. sort of teaser at E3 or one of those big video game conventions to show off the graphics and a bit of the storyline. The graphics were too good. I was uncomfortable. And actually a lot of the reaction to that clip coming out at the time, I think was also like, oh my God, like, is this too, too much, too graphic? Like in the same scene, you see someone kind of like almost dying from being hung. Like it's a super dark, the game is super dark and depressing. I would recommend it. But it is, you have to be prepared for the fact you're watching an incredibly, or you're playing an I guess incredibly I depressing I just don't understand game. why there is a need to depict at that level of graphic detail these kinds of violent acts. I can understand in spirit there's a storyline around like, oh, you got to fight each other, who's going to win or whatever the war is. I mean, but like, why do they have to do that graphic detail? It's just so disturbing. I mean, I don't think it's gratuitous, though. Like, there are video games where they're just violent for the sake of being violent and just sort of knowing that there's young boys who are going to get off at, you know, people blowing up. I think it's it's a story about civilization rebuilding itself after a zombie infection wipes out uh, civilization. So you think it's realistic? So I think it is realistic to depict that people would start eating each other. I'm going to die in the new world. (laughs) I will not make it. (laughs) All right, well, that's what's going on in my world right now. What's going on in Christine's world? Which part? What do you mean? In saying, my brain well, or? <laughs> I'm just saying, so I've been enjoying playing video games. Mm-hmm. That's something I've been up to. What What have the last few weeks been like for you simply? They've been okay. As I've mentioned before, I've been dealing with some uh, eye rash issues. But it might actually look better today because I'm on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the way to intro this uh, this uh, segment is Christine is on steroids. <laughs> but to be clear, um, I am on corticosteroids, not to be confused with anabolic steroids. Sure, not, which are not, not promoting... Two very different things. We're not promoting performance-enhancing drugs here. No, they are very different things, and I had to even Google it to make sure because they both use the short form term steroids. They're just steroids. So they're very easy to confuse conceptually. So just you want to give people some context. You've yeah. been having these so allergic like reactions. A few months ago, well, actually three years ago, this happened to me. Mm-hmm. Um, my eyes just blew up in a rash and they were just incredibly swollen. And not just appearance wise, uh, but they hurt. They sting. Putting any lotion, even water on them, it feels mm-hmm. like tiny little razor cuts all around my eyes. Um, and it's a very distinct red ring. It's not eczema, which is usually asymmetrical and kind of spreads and comes and goes and mm-hmm. is annoying, which I've always had on my hands. Or um, It's something else. And three years ago, we did determine that I was allergic to certain things in makeup. And then I stopped wearing those makeup and mm-hmm. I, I thought it kind of went away. I also thought getting these uh, allergic, I think, reactions was correlated with a lot of travel. And like every time I went to VidCon and put on a ton of heavy makeup and didn't wash it for off for like 10 hours. Sure. And just the stress of traveling too probably triggers it. However, in quarantine, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not (laughs) hugging anyone. I'm not exposed to new pollutions and I'm not playing or I haven't worn makeup in months. It doesn't mean you're not feeling stressed though. Right. So that's the only factor. (laughs) So I guess like the steroids aren't 
treating the cause, but they're treating the symptom, right? They're treating your body's reaction to it. Yeah, so basically corticosteroids, which mm -hmm. are not muscle enhancers, <laughs> they um, help reduce inflammation. Um, so I guess, I don't really know the underlying cause. We're still trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And it's been a few months of like doctors and blood tests and whatever, and mm -hmm. gonna do some allergy tests too. Uh, but a corticosteroid will temporarily reduce inflammation in your body that is negatively reacting to something. So it's doing that now and my eye rash has gone down. Mm -hmm. But I did this before two months ago and it came right back after the course of the corticosteroids was done. So whether so, it's stress or an environmental factor, something is triggering a reaction in your eyes. And right. You so, still need to figure out what that is. So once uh, this course of treatment uh, is done, it might come back. So I'm kind of like mm -hmm. sad at the idea, like it'll probably come back. And then my eyes are going to feel like they're glued shut in the morning mm -hmm. and then they're going to swell. Okay, and let's not be so pessimistic. You're feeling good now. I'm feeling good now, but I'm afraid and it will of, come back. because we still don't know why it's happening. And as much as, uh, you know, we're Canadians and proud of the Canadian healthcare system, I will say this has been a pretty frustrating process. Like, I know it's also during a pandemic, so maybe it's sort of changing what this would be like. But, you know, even it's hard to find and get a dermatologist to see you yeah. in Canada sometimes. And that's really frustrating. And I get that it's a great thing that healthcare is available to everyone. But when you have the means and are willing to pay for healthcare, it's kind of like, please, can I just pay someone to just see me now? It's kinda... Well, that's the thing. I, I don't pay my dermatologist or my doctor. Zero dollars, mm -hmm. really, from my pocket. The only thing I paid for it was like two dollars for the prescription. Yeah. It was literally two dollars and 80 cents for the corticosteroid prescription. Sure, sure. That's it. And that's because of our provincial health insurance and also our... Our government sure. top up insurance. So your eyes are feeling much better now that you're taking steroids. It also has the side effect of Christine has just been like crazy yeah. the last. <laughs> I've been annoying Ben. So the negative effects of corticosteroids. Is it negative? Or? I mean, it, it gives you energy um, because yeah. it's like boosting your I don't know energy levels I guess, uh, but it makes me really restless, highly irritable, and I have a really hard time sleeping and focusing on anything. I find it really hard to just like sit down and do work, which is not good as a YouTuber who's editing videos most sure. of the time. So I don't think I've been doing very well at that lately <laughs> yeah. because I just want to go for a walk all the time. I feel like I'm a dog. In the yeah. morning, I'm like, Ben, let's go for a walk. And yeah. then at night, I'm like, let's go for a walk. <laughs> Yeah, you're kind of all over the place. And I, I hear you're waking up in the middle of the night. You're yeah, not sleeping like all that well. Yeah, like 3 a.m. I'm awake. And then, yeah. yeah, so it's not fun, but I it's worth it to hopefully fix my eyes. Because... Do you think it's helped your weight training at all? No. <laughs> no? <laughs> because if anything, long-term use of this is not good for your muscles because it has been shown to cause muscle atrophy. I also looked at that. Yeah. Oh. So it's so just temporarily like you, energy boost. It's like you get a superficial boost of energy. So maybe you'll like have way more steps in that day, but you certainly won't be lifting heavier because oh. of your energy levels. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay. It's like if you drink too much coffee, maybe similar to that. <laughs> so you shouldn't try the weighted blanket experiment again and maybe you could lift maybe twice could as many. Maybe I could double. Yeah. <laughs> Now I can do 30 blankets. But I need the weighted blankets on me now just to calm me down because I'm just even crazier. <laughs> yeah, those blankets have come in handy now. Uh, yeah. Do you want to tell people how they uh, test for allergies? Because you're probably going to have to go through that yeah, soon, right? Yeah, because I did this three years ago and I didn't mm -hmm. mention it at the time because, I don't know, just like your personal health things. I you don't have to talk about explain. this if you don't want no, to. No, but I, this, I haven't done it yet and I think it's interesting. And anyone who has had allergy tests in the past might find it kind of cool to hear someone else talk about it so there's a few different types of allergy tests there's like if you're allergic to a food or like animal dander they might do uh, prick tests mm -hmm. and then if you're if the assumption or the theory is that you're allergic to something like atopic like something that you'd put on your skin then they do patch testing mm -hmm. so that's what we did three years ago and what will probably repeat soon i'm just on a waiting list for that mm -hmm. um so basically they take like 70 to 90 different concentrated versions of known allergens like maybe it's something found in fragrance or uh, uh different like uh, chemicals in makeup or shampoo and they'll mm -hmm. put them as la tiny little pieces on your back and then they'll tape your back yeah 
and they'll leave it there for I think it's 96 hours and they'll mark with pen like numbers across your back of exactly mm -hmm. what uh, material was there. So they make a map on your back and then they copy and paste it onto like a template so they know what's what. And then after 96 hours of wearing tape on your back, which you can't shower, <laughs> it's hard to move and you can't take it off or else it'll screw up the experiment. After they take that off, they can identify what little parts of your back like blew up as a reaction. Like if you were allergic to anything, right. any of the things they taped to your back, it would be pretty clear having that right. thing touching your Constantly skin for that long. For right? that long, yeah. So last time there were some things you were obviously allergic right. to. I think they're going to test more things this, this time. time yeah. And here's the scary thing, like allergies can change over time. You can be mm -hmm. not allergic to something one year and then over the course of a year or two, just all of a sudden you're allergic to something that didn't cause you any issues before. Yeah. Even my allergies to cats, like when I first met you, you had Xyler, didn't cause any issues. I feel like over time I have gotten progressively Either I've gotten more allergic to cats or we just do a worse job of <laughs> vacuuming up the cat hair around our house now. It's probably the cleaning. It might but... be a combination <laughs> of the two. How about that? Yeah. But that'll be fun when I do that. I just hope that the test does not say nail polish mm -hmm. because I will be very upset. <laughs> <laughs> nail polish. I don't think it's nail polish. I think I would know because I would have a flare up every time I painted my nails or something. Right, which, yeah. Which I absolutely, like I observe all of these things and I've done certain elimination things and I've changed hand creams and shampoos and so many things at the recommendation of my dermatologist just to like try, you know, and figure it out yourself. And I cannot find anything in particular. So mm -hmm. it's still very much a mystery, especially because I'm not wearing makeup. So I'm not putting anything directly on my face. So it's got to be something like secondary. Yeah. Well, speaking of steroids, sports are back. How excited are you about that, Christine? Why is that connected <laughs> to sports? Is that because stero steroids use in sports? What are you saying? There's a lot of uh, PED usage in sports. What's PED? Uh, performance enhancing oh. drugs. The kind of steroids you aren't on. Okay, I thought it. I was just trying to do a little cheeky transition, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm lost. What, okay. What's a sport, Ben? <laughs> so I've been watching a lot of sports lately. You've noticed this. I've been yes, watching a hockey. lot of hockey. Hockey is going on right now. It's kind of the first time things have sort of felt like they're going back to normal in a way for me to have live sports on the TV. Yeah, because there was months where there wasn't any sports really. And then there was yeah. this period of like, will they ever come back? Yeah, lots of talk, uh, talk of how to set up a, a bubble so that they can safely resume play. So is this yeah. Canadian sports that we're talking about? Or is it like well, overlap? It's like both, both So the, the basketball season has resumed and they're playing in like a compound in Walt Disney World in Florida. So that's mm -hmm. their way of staying safe. They're keeping everyone within a bubble down there. And hockey is sort of similar that... Uh, they basically decided the way of safely doing it is to just bring all the teams to two different cities in Canada. Because uh, <laughs> I guess there were some American cities they were considering doing, and I'm pretty sure it was almost going to be Las Vegas. And then right around the time they had to make a decision, there was a huge spike in, of cases in Las Vegas in the general population. Uh -huh. So right now, like every hockey team uh, in the top 24 teams in the league are split between Toronto and Edmonton. And they're playing hockey and they're playing like competitive and playoff hockey. American now. teams playing in these Canadian. Yeah. So the, the Canadian government basically made an exception for those Canadian for those Canadian citizens or players from uh, American teams, sorry, to to fly into Canada to exist within a bubble because they've, they've rented out hotels and they securely transport people from the hotels directly to the, the stadiums, the arenas without leaving and what about the their their families so their families aren't with them uh, so nobody's families i think towards the, the players, end like the uh, like it's a playoff right so there less and less teams are going to advance through the rounds i think once they're towards the end and it's only going to be in edmonton i think i think they're going to let their families come into the bubble so to speak and then but if they do that their families can't leave right presumably or else it's not a bubble like once they come in yeah yeah, and no. They are uh, tested, I'm assuming. I mean, I'm not an expert on their protocols, but it seems to me that like they're doing a really good job of actually setting up a safe environment for these guys. They're doing hmm. they did testing on their way in. I think they have mostly flew them in on like private charters. If anything, like that might be one of the safest places to be right now is in existing within one of these sports bubbles they've set it's up just with crazy testing. It's crazy to me that 
there's probably so many millions of dollars being sunk into Mm -hmm. you know making the games go on and these players and all their families being accommodated and tested and flown in private jets and it's funny you say that so there's a lot of money going into it clearly but i think the uh, economic ramifications of them not playing more games and all the money they would make from tv contracts and Mm. like it it would have been devastating for the National Hockey League specifically to not finish to the season. Just, I don't understand. Well, this to the as owners well. and the players. So I don't know how okay. inside sports we want to get here, but basically, a lot of these leagues have revenue sharing models where, like, the players have a salary, but at the end of the year, if the league wasn't profitable, the owners sort of have a, an agreement where some money is comes back in escrow. They say. So if the league couldn't finish the season and they were running a huge deficit and they lost millions of dollars, the owners and the players would feel the effect of that, essentially. So it was in the interest of the players and the owners of the to, teams to, come back. to continue the, the hmm. to finish hockey in some sense. And also, I don't think we should discount the fact that a lot of people just feel like this is in Canada, especially when it comes to hockey, it almost feels like this is a public service. Like, you know what I mean? People miss hockey so much. We love hockey so much is in it Canada. Though, like, is that fair to say? Yes, I think it is. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I'm coming uh, at it I know from an you're, you're the outsider. You're the anomaly here. But I, I think, you know, like when Canada's playing in the Olympics for hockey, more than half the country is watching that game. Hockey is sort of like the sport people care about mm-hmm. in Canada, right? So I'm not saying like they should have come back if it wasn't safe to do so. I think even fans were sort of taking the position they should only do this if it is safe, if they have a safe way of proceeding. I guess your perspective on this really changes whether you're a fan of hockey or not. Because if you love watching hockey and you have a favorite team, absolutely you want this to continue because it gives you a sense of joy and something to do, some kind of normalcy. Mm -hmm. But if you don't care about sports and think it's a waste of money, I can absolutely see looking at it that way because one of my first reactions in watching the game was like, mm-hmm. now there's no crowds, right? Yeah. And I just my first thought was, what about all the people who used to work in the stadiums and all the jobs that are presumably lost because they don't need yeah. them anymore because of precautions for the players' safety? Yeah, but I I think we just hope that things can go back to normal in the next year or two. Hopefully the billionaire owners who own these sports teams will mm-hmm. continue to pay their employees, do at we, least to some do we extent. Do know that at all? Or? Yeah, there have been stories about that. Some have been better than mm-hmm. others. Some, yeah, I, I don't want to get into that too much. I, I don't know enough yeah, about no, it. Yeah, no, it's fine if you don't know exactly. Different it's leagues, just... different owners have been handling that in different ways. Uh, I imagine there are a lot of people who depend on that income that are kind of hurting right now. Some people who are only getting part of their salary as opposed to all of it, things like that, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, there's... There's a huge industry and a lot of people who benefit financially from sports outside of the, you know, athletes who with their million dollar contracts, who, right? Other than sponsors and advertisers and providers sure. of equipment. And the billionaire owners right. who own teams. I'm not saying anyone should feel sorry for them, but there are people who depend on these leagues and these teams for jobs outside of millionaires yeah. and billionaires too. Yeah. And are those people still getting compensated in some form if they're not needed in the current COVID environment? Well, I think like the league has to be financially viable during this difficult time for there to be jobs to to come back to when they can let people back into these stadiums. I can see that argument. Yeah. We have good debates. I feel like <laughs> we, we have had these similar debates, uh, not on the podcast, you just in real life, like talking to each other. Because I'm always trying to challenge you and be like, but why? All this money, why? I've noticed we've disagreed on things a few mm-hmm. times on podcasts. And I notice a lot of comments about people, I guess, surprised that we're able to have a conversation. Just be able to have like a reasonable disagreement. What it makes me that? wonder what sort of uh, couple role models they have in their lives that aren't able to talk about things they don't agree with without it turning into a fight you know what's also interesting is i think youtubers if you watch a couple online on youtube they're probably only only showing you like their sweetest moments right yeah like here's a vlog of how happy our lives is with our dog and (laughs) we're by the pool drinking mojitos you never really see like the real bickering and disagreements that couples just will you if you if you live with someone you're going to occasionally disagree with them right 
But sometimes disagreeing isn't even bad. Like we disagree on a lot of things, but I find them to be insightful conversations for the most totally. part. Totally. I just think I mean, people... there's, there's always superficial things we disagree on. Like, ew, I hate that color. You're so wrong, yeah. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but just for like when we're talking about video games or hockey and like why should sports come back and these kinds of things, like we'll disagree and we'll be like, point counterpoint and then we'll see each other's side and be like oh interesting i didn't know that but also have you considered this sure and i think people just aren't used to seeing couples disagree at all on the internet i think that's it's that's healthy the point, to it? disagree guys just sure. don't yell and you know get <laughs> emotionally charged and upset and unrightfully so we're gonna like hurt each other over it <laughs> like i'm we're, we're not vengefully disagreeing with each other uh -huh. We don't really fight all that often. Have we ever talked about this? We just get annoyed. Well, sure. And of course, these days with us, like we've still been very much, we're still acting like we're in the height of a pandemic. And yeah, I think we are going nowhere. <laughs> a lot of people are getting fatigued with this idea of having to still socially distance or keep small bubbles of people. Like we see your sister, my brother. I go to the grocery store sometimes with a mask. That's basically That's the extent it. of us leaving the I, house now. I still. never leave the house unless we're going for a walk. And we, we can walk around our area sure. without being within six feet of So, anyone. yeah, we yeah. do live in an area where we can walk where we are or we can just take a sh quick drive. And uh, Ottawa's a nice city in terms of having some green space or very walkable neighborhoods. Yeah. So I feel fortunate for that. Like some people in L.A., I guess I understand a little bit more. Actually, they've got nature and trails and stuff. But a lot of people maybe live in areas of bigger cities where as soon as you yeah. walk out the front door, it's not as possible you're in the to... middle of a big city, right? Which I understand. Yeah. But this kind of brings us to another point of people <laughs> who aren't socially distancing or in taking yeah. the pandemic seriously. And they have the means to take it seriously and they still don't do it because they're just stupid. So I, what I, Christine's talking about is we've seen quite a few stories lately about influencers or digital media celebrities in L.A. Mm -hmm. having parties lately. And I feel like, yeah, we did want to at least address it. Maybe it's sort of old news at this point. But I think we just need more voices of reasonable people on YouTube just condemning this behavior, honestly. It's just it's so frustrating to me because I'm someone who is incredibly fortunate that we have a, a big house like we used to live in a smaller condo mm -hmm. and I, I'm thinking like if we still live there I would probably be 10 times more crazy than I am currently sure. because at least in our home now I can go to a separate room mm -hmm. <laughs> previously I did not have that luxury so I understand from people who are living in smaller quarters are living with more than you know a few people maybe you're with roommates or with you're with family and you're just like all so annoyed with each other that it is incredibly hard on your mental health to just stay in your house I get that. Mm -hmm. What I don't understand and what is so frustrating is the people who have the means, the large YouTubers, they live in beautiful places, they have millions of dollars, they can do whatever the fuck they want in their mm -hmm. backyard, have a pool party with themselves and just their best friend and their assistant who lives them. <laughs> and yet they still go to these parties with hundreds of people, they yeah. go out to dinners and they just like don't even care. Yeah, it's why? pretty awful. And you I, don't, like, it. why? It's funny how like the transmission of of the coronavirus has really shifted to to young people now it seems right like mm -hmm. the world health organization came out the other day being asking young people basically like do you really need to party so badly that it's worth making your parents and grandparents sick but here's the thing i think you make a really good point i get it if you're if you're a student and you've been stuck in a you know bachelor mm -hmm. one bedroom apartment for months and now, you just and you're just want to go to your, your friend's house, and or your you just boyfriend's house, or something. Go to the beach or go go to the bar and have a beer. I get that frustration, but I think yeah. you make a really good point that if you're a YouTuber who lives in a mansion with an assistant and you have a pool, and you already have a friend group that is sort of within your bubble that is coming in and out of your home, isn't that good enough? Do you need to be having like? Am I missing something? Why are birthday parties so, so important to, to young adults? I mean, <laughs> I guess their argument, and I saw this from some manager of a TikTok house. I don't know. <laughs> some manager of a something house on social media gave yeah. a statement recently that the reason why his protégés or his people, his talent his clients, was, yeah. was doing this was because it was part of their job and they're not going to stop entertaining just because there's a pandemic. So his argument was that 
they need to have giant parties to entertain people so that they can continue their business model. Oh, that's your business model. And I'm like, oh, interesting. I also entertain people by myself. <laughs> like, okay. I mean, at the end of the day, like, you know, fuck those people. Like, I don't care if those people get sick, but I feel bad but for... But they're not... Yeah, think of who, are. who are the people who are going to be affected. It's the people that the manager, have to work, hopefully. the people in the service industry, the people working at the restaurants that yeah. those people are coming mm -hmm. into. They're the people at risk, right? And I bet you those people, those servers at restaurants where influencers come already hate those people coming in oh, yeah. pre-pandemic. And now they hate them even more. <laughs> yeah, it's tough, man. Uh, yeah, I don't know what to say. I denounce the behavior of <laughs> not not all, but some online influencers it's bad it, it seems to be the younger ones it's just why and it, it just shows all the more a level of ungratefulness that we already see from their behaviors over the years and just like their actions and attitudes and things they say about people um but this demonstrates that even more to me the le a level of ungratefulness yeah this mm -hmm. is gonna sound kind of terrible maybe I <laughs> here's a meme take a shot when ben says maybe i shouldn't say this but no uh, Take a sip of tea. It almost like if someone who was really important to young people had gotten really sick with coronavirus early on, I wonder if that would have changed how serious young people took mm -hmm. it. I think you're you're right to a degree. Like I wouldn't want to name a name or wish that upon any individual. Sure, of course. But people, if they saw their idol or someone they really looked up to get this and then turn around and say, actually, you better fucking take this seriously because look what happened to me. Therefore, it could happen to you. Yeah. In the same way that they kind of sell this idea that, look how I got here. If I did this and, and, and I did this on not much, you could do it too. Because I think that's a lot of what YouTubers and online influencers try and sell their audience, is mm -hmm. that if I could do it, you could do it. So kind of in a weird, twisted way, if they could get COVID and get extremely sick yeah. from it so could you and i do agree that i think audiences would take that seriously however i don't wish that upon any sure yeah and maybe that's that's probably a stupid way of looking at it honestly but if we're just gonna say that like these youtubers are role models or these celebrities to young people yeah they should seeing them wearing masks and being responsible and social distancing would go a long way to having more young people take mm -hmm. this seriously and not just going to parties and then apologizing for going to parties like just <laughs> yeah just like you know what either. you're doing is <laughs> <Yeah>. wrong <laughs> like you're just apologizing that you got caught or that there was blowback for it right yeah and a lot of these people clearly aren't apologetic at all they're just trying to play a pr game they're just yeah i think it's a lot of saving face and listening to their pr person and we should acknowledge that like young people the evidence seems to be that young people are less at risk of getting very sick, but really it's more about protecting the people in your circle who might not be as protected. Like if you're a healthy young person, chances are you'll be okay. That's not to say there haven't been healthy young people that haven't gone very sick, but it's more likely that you have a parent or a friend who's immunocompromised. And then it's just like, is it really worth going to the bar on a Friday night or going to a birthday, uh, a, party. a birthday party like, <laughs> like you don't, at this point i understand wanting to celebrate with your friends mm -hmm. so do you not have a couple friends like that's it you don't you can do that at home i just don't get maybe i'm just not a party person so it's easy <laughs> for me to say okay that's true right we're not people that get off on being extroverted so we're yeah. not feeling it the same way people who really sort of rely mentally and emotionally on social interaction are i think Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also true. So there true. is something to be said for that. But it's just, it's selfishness also, is that I'm seeing. Like, yeah. they're, they're being selfish. And they're putting yeah. their own needs of wanting to be seen and partying and, uh, I don't know, throwing cakes at each other. I don't know. <laughs> is that what drinking, people do at parties? Drinking with others. <laughs> what Sh do sharing do drinks. <laughs> sharing drinks. Drinking, yeah. Yeah, in conclusion, people suck, right? <laughs> also, parties suck. <laughs> I just have a nail painting party with myself. I just paint my nails by myself. When you were like 20, 21, did birthday parties really matter anymore? I feel like I was so over. Mm -hmm. Like, I think, well, when I was 21, I, that was already when I was like slowing down. <laughs> like I got old <laughs> Your quick. Your party days were behind yeah. you. Yeah. Um, we used to go to like the club or out for, sure. for someone's birthday. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it wasn't really about gifts. Like no one really brought gifts. We just yeah. like all brought a bottle of wine or something maybe i'm the weird one i just i remember birthday parties being a thing for like children yeah for sure so like this idea that i have to throw myself a big 
21st year old birthday bash with like a hundred people and oh no fireworks yeah. and big i never like, witnessed dancers. that but we were also not you know very successful influencers <laughs> at the age of 21 so i think it's just everything goes on the extremes when yeah. you're that age and you have millions of dollars and so do your friends so you're just gonna go you got to try and top it every time and that's kind of just what happens all right well apologies to tanner fox we were gonna have him on today but i, I think what he was wasn't that? he wasn't feeling too well i Is think he TikToker? i think he went to one of those parties i don't think he was feeling oh, great fuck. so uh i don't know who that is but ben I, is sorry I, for I, suggesting I, I guess we'll see you next taco tuesday oh i wanted next, to thank oh. you guys for four hundred thousand subscribers on oh, simply pod logical that's exciting yay, yay. we have four hundred thousand people who said i want to hear these people talk on tuesday <laughs> You thank go. you guys it's very cool thank you very much we're gonna keep trying to pump out content for you once a week on taco tuesday remember that today is tuesday it is your weekly reminder mm -hmm. because i know we're all losing sense of time and space <laughs> in this quarantine <laughs> land and we are responsibly practicing social distancing if we can and are able to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and thank you for the reaction to the gen episode that we put up last was that last week yeah it was really good. It makes me think, you know, the idea of having guests come on, like we'll probably have my brother come on soon and there are other people we'd like to have on. So I think that went well and we'd like to do more of that in the future. Yeah, that as was well. fun. <laughs> and then we'll have your brother and my sister compete. Who knows who better? Compete for what? <laughs> <I don't> okay. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next Taco Tuesday. See ya. Bye. See y'all later.